Good afternoon and good morning to some. My name is Michaela Seward. I am a senior talent acquisition consultant for Marsh McLennan, and I support the Mercer business. I've been with the firm for seven years, um, and I support recruiting specifically in the central market. I'm joined today by my colleagues, William Randall, who supports our East Market, and Shannon Gaspard, who supports our West Market and Texas. I'm really excited to be moderating this event today. Um, this is the first time ever that we're giving students an opportunity to hear and learn from some of the leaders of our business. For anyone who's not familiar with Mercer, we are a human capital consulting firm made up of three primary lines of business, health, wealth, and career. And today we have four esteemed colleagues representing these areas who I will introduce in just a moment. The purpose of today's growth and culture session is to provide you with a better understanding of how our senior colleagues got to where they are now in their career, what the future of work looks like within the business, what they're most excited about as we come out of the pandemic and move into this new normal, what's on the horizon and how you can build a career here. Each panelist will start out by sharing their career story and a little bit about the business they support. But after that, the floor will be yours to ask any and all questions that you may have for them. So as they are speaking, if something comes to mind, please feel free to type it in the chat or write it down so that you don't forget. We will invite you to come off mute when we open up the lines to questions. Some housekeeping items before we get started. Um, your line should be muted already, but if not, please keep your line muted unless you're asking a question. This session is being recorded and we'll send out the recording shortly after the call. We do currently have positions posted, so please check Handshake for all of our job opportunities. And lastly, we would love for you to enable your camera, especially when we stop sharing the deck and open it up to Q&A as it makes the experience much more engaging for all of us. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists and then I'll turn it over to them to share their story. So first off, we've got Sam Espinosa. He is a partner and national practice leader based out of the Phoenix office in Mercer's Government Human Services Consulting Group, which is part of Mercer's health and benefits practice. Sam is responsible for leading the government team to assist our clients in understanding their vision and goals, develop a strategic approach, and organize the resources of Mercer and its partners in helping the client succeed. Sam has been a consultant for over 20 years and has successfully assisted clients in launching new initiatives or improving program fiscal integrity and Medicaid managed care, long-term care planning and budgeting, hospital rate setting and financing, rebalancing, LTC payment reform, self-determination, health exchanges, and person-centered planning. Sam has worked with over 21 states and has managed engagements ranging from two to 75 participating consultants with program related fees under advisement ranging from 5 million to over 10 billion annually. Next, we have Eric Grossman. Eric is a senior partner and health and benefits business leader for Mercer's East Market. Prior to his current role, he was business leader for Mercer Marketplace 365 and Mercer's voluntary benefits business. Eric is an expert in the strategic development, design, financing, and management of health and group benefits programs. He has contributed to employer innovation and healthcare quality, cost management, and member engagement, including the measurement and evaluation of provider performance and the application of performance metrics to yield advantages for plan sponsors and their plan members. Allison Lum is a principal in Mercer's Seattle office and is a member of the National Defined Contribution Specialty Group in the Wealth Practice. She joined the firm in 2003 and began her career as a defined benefit actuarial analyst, specializing in both multi-employer and corporate pension plans. She assisted in the development of pension and retiree medical actuarial valuations for ERISA funding, pension and post-retirement medical accounting matters, IRS annual returns and employee benefit plans, and pension non-discrimination testing. Allison transitioned to the Defined Contribution Group in 2010, where she now focuses on all aspects of DC plans. Areas of expertise include non-discrimination testing, plan design, including cost estimates, vendor searches, fee benchmarking, plan administration, ongoing plan management, including overseeing committee meetings and plan governance, governmental reporting and disclosure, 
compliance reviews and corrections, project management for integration of qualified plans and plan operational compliance. It's a mouthful. Um, and last but not least, Andre Rooks. He's a senior principal at Mercer's Career Practice, where he is responsible for developing strategies that improve the outcome for rewards programs. Andre earned a Bachelor's of Science in Economics from the University of Illinois and an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sam Espinosa to share his story. Hi, thanks so much. Um, currently I lead the Government Human Services Consulting Team and really that's where I've worked most of my career in Mercer. But if you go all the way back to the lower left of my career story, I started out as an undergrad at the University of Arizona. Uh, and truth be told, I was a psychology major with a math minor originally and uh, didn't want I didn't want to stay in school anymore. I was like, well, I, I can't really get a job with a psych, my, you know, a psych major only in the field I want, doing what I want. So I finished out my math degree and had a psych and math degree. Um, my first job out of college, if you go to the next bubble, I was a healthcare underwriter. And I'll be frank with you all, I was a terrible healthcare underwriter. I just did not like the work. It felt very siloed to me, very limiting. I spent more time uh, digging into the data and the system than I did doing the actual job. And so after uh, essentially a year and a half of doing that work, I kind of said, this is not a fit for me and went looking for something else. A recruiter called and said, uh, there's a consulting uh, opportunity for you across the street. Would you like to talk to them? And I said, sure, I'll try it. And I joined Mercer in 1997 uh, as an analyst, which many of you, if you choose to join Mercer, would join at that career level. Um, I was going to do health and benefits and government health care, the two business units that were in the Phoenix office at that time. Um, so you can let more money accumulate and split wise. You don't need to like pay back everything. Oh. No worries. <laughs> Essentially, there was about 30 people in the government practice at that time, and I was one of like five analysts. And uh, immediately, I just knew I was doing the right work. And you'll see my tagline up there do meaningful work. Uh, when it wasn't working for me at Cigna, I felt very limited. It was a very siloed organization structure. Underwriters did a very technical function. They couldn't do the actuarial work because that was the actuaries. They couldn't talk to the clients, that was sales. And so I felt very stifled. Here at Mercer, I was able to um, talk to clients directly in my first few weeks, uh, be responsible for big decisions, run the data, um, kind of educate myself, which I liked a lot versus going through a very program learning process. Um, so it just, it was a night and day difference experience for me. And I knew within weeks that this was gonna be a great job. Uh, I got married to my wife, Heidi, three months after working here. We're still married today and I have seven children. So uh, Mercer has supported me through that whole life journey as well as making up into my career journey. Um, after a couple years uh, doing the technical work in consulting, at least in our business and government, you kind of become a, a senior analyst or a lead analyst where you're really trained and can do all the work independently. And what really happened to me is my career continued to grow because once I mastered something, there'd come a new twist. So once I became an analytic lead, they started assigning newer analysts to me to work with. So I knew the work, I could do the work, but now I was responsible to help others do the work and really lead them in the analytic work that was getting done. So the job got complicated because while I could do the work, teaching somebody how to do it was a very different skill set. Communicating with the client about requirements was a different skill set. And so Soon I had to find, again, I had to learn and it still stayed meaningful and relevant because it was still challenging. After a little while, I became a really good senior analyst and now I became a project manager. So now I'm not only worrying about the analytic tasks of the assignment, but the consulting tasks, the workflow, the scheduling, the client planning. And so again, the role changed and became complicated and new skills I had to grow and adapt to. Eventually, after doing the project manager role, I transitioned to what we call a client leader some in Mercer call client managers, but really responsible for the client relationship, uh, the profitability of the client, the uh, expansion of client work and other opportunities and ultimate client satisfaction. So again, once a set of skills was mastered at the project level, now I was responsible for owning client relationships and all the dimensions that come with that. You know, the client's organization structure, helping them be successful, making sure our team is organized right. And so again, I had to acquire new skills and continue to grow in, in my Mercer role and Mercer career. After a few years of doing that, um, I moved and started a new line of consulting for our team. 
uh, called Home and Community-Based Services Consulting. Historically, we have not advised states in these areas. My group uh, exclusively advises state programs. And these are services that um, historically states have bought at a very commoditized level. And I felt Russia could create some new space here, bringing our actuarial and other financial disciplines. We could, we could compete against existing competitors and offer something new and had a lot of success in creating a consulting space that previously had not been in the practice. After a couple of years of doing that, I realized one of the things about my role that I was charged about was sales. And so I moved from doing HCBS consulting and really trying to drive as an individual contributor sales and business development for the team. Um, and you'll see after that focus on sales, I left Mercer for a year. I felt like I was a, it was a chance I could go work for a mentor of mine in a direct sales role doing nothing but sales. And I was really excited about it. Um, but I only lasted one year away from the firm and came back as a sales leader. And one of the reasons I left was I felt like I, there was a lot more I needed to learn about sales and selling, and I did, but I didn't, I didn't have, it, they were, these weren't my people. I hadn't been working with them all these years. And so that meaningfulness of the work wasn't there for me. I wasn't working for people that I knew well, that I had sort of normed with my whole career. And so I came back to Mercer in a new role with new skills a year later now as a sales leader for our practice. Um, at the time, uh, we were short in our senior consultant area. We didn't have enough senior consultants. We had a client uh, have the partner who was running that client leave. And so I stepped in to run that client as a strategist, uh, meaning I'm responsible for really setting the course of where the client's going in our relationship with Mercer and the state programs, but I had to keep the sales leader job going as well. So now I'm learning how to juggle two very different roles. One I do fairly well, client strategist, client executive, and train somebody and my sales leader role. So that was another set of skills that I had to grow into. After a while, I moved from that role to the office leader role and became a partner in the firm. And again, very different skills. Um, in this role, I, you really have to be responsible for the operations of the office, staff engagement, staff retention, uh, competing on a local level where applicable. And so I took that role and again, you know, um, had to acquire new skills. Again, a year later, we had uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts needed an executive sponsor to run that. We did not have enough senior talent at the time. So I took that client on and over the four years I worked with them, you know, tripled the size of our relationship um, while running the Phoenix office and doing the sales leader role uh, as, as, as I could. And then after a few more years of that role, I became the national practice leader for the practice um, and so what began as a journey in 1997 with 30 consultants, today we have over 400 consultants and we consult to about 30 different states. Um, and Medicaid has really emerged as a large purchaser where now today one in four individuals in the country are enrolled in Medicaid. Um, and again, new skills as a practice leader working inside the Mercer organization broadly, finding new connections and solutions for our clients involving other partners in Mercer and being part of the national leadership team for health. Um, and then again, new skills have to get developed because now we're in the pandemic and we've had to learn how to work remotely in a different model. We've had to learn how to hire people and onboard people in a different uh, consulting environment. We can't just walk you know, next door to people. We've been leading, dealing with all of the social changes and growth that we've been having as a country. And so leading in a pandemic is sort of the next series of challenges that I've been adapting to and growing in. And, Finally, you know, what's next? I don't know. But I do know if I look through my whole career story, um, the first thing that popped out for me as I assembled this was it was always meaningful for me. Each role I took was relevant and important, connected to my values and what I wanted to do in my career and who I wanted to do it with um, and was always changing. I mean, I think that was probably one of my biggest frustrations at the beginning was thinking as I, I look at the underwriters 20 years senior to me and they were kind of doing the same job, just you know, a different titling, but it was basically the same. And my, my career at Mercer has been extremely varied and challenging the whole journey. So uh, that's what I have to offer and I, I won't take too much more time. Taylor. Thank you. Okay, Steve. I guess I'm up. So hi everybody, thanks for joining. My name is Eric Grossman. Um, 
I graduated from college, let's just say I am very confident well before any of you were born, unfortunately. Um, and I decided to go the insurance route out of college. I did not make a good choice. The reason I did not make a good choice is I went to a company called Colonial Pen and their primary business was developing and selling insurance products to members of ARP, which is the American Association of Retired People, join their actuarial group. About six months in, 60 minutes did an expose about how all of the senior execs at Colonial Pen were ripping off all the old people. Suffice it to say, that entire block of business moved at that time to, to Prudential within six months and the actuarial department went from about a hundred people to four people. I decided I was not gonna wait for that to happen. So I, I, I moved out of my first job pretty quickly. At that point, I, I, I decided that I would try, um, you know, pension actuarial consulting, went to a, a consulting firm to do that, um, became a fellow of the Society of Actuaries at that point. Um, I was working in, in Houston for this company. And in the early days, it was the, the big boom in oil and gas in Texas. And we were putting in plan after plan after plan and they were growing. And then a couple of years later, it was the first big bust for oil and gas in Texas. And we were taking out the same plans that we had just put in a couple of years earlier than that. Um, so I, I made the decision to move on from, from pension world and I joined Mercer um, about 30 years ago in, in the health business. Um, and what's really kept me here and kept me interested is I've had the privilege to continually be involved in a lot of innovation. Now, part of that is because I get bored easily and when you innovate, you always get to do something new. Um, but there's also a lot of excitement to getting involved in innovation. And one of the things you will find with Mercer is we are a very entrepreneurial culture. There are lots of people who get involved in various innovation efforts. So I know for those of you who are on video under that have been innovating ever since light bulb, there's a bunch of jargon um, and I'm not going to go through it all, um, but we were um, we, we we worked with a client to do the first of what is called managed competition, which is simply put, pitting one health plan against another, let them compete, and give preferential pricing to those who competed better, and try to shift the market that way. Uh, that then became pretty commonplace. Um, we skipped down a couple. Um, I did get involved in the first digital revolution. Again, bef before you guys were born and before the big bust. And my funny story there is we we're working with a consulting firm called Diamond Consulting, which no longer exists. Um, they had probably been around for a couple of years before we started working with them. They were tiny, they weren't making any money. and to show you what happened in the first internet boom, their market valuation was more than the market valuation of Marsh and McLennan. And then two years later, they, they didn't exist. But it was exciting, uh, an exciting time and exciting work. Um, I've done a lot of innovation in what's known as high performance networks. Um, that's just a fancy way of saying, how do we establish um, networks of doctors and hospitals that employees and their family members can access through the health plan where we are shifting care toward doctors and hospitals that are higher performers, both on a quality perspective and on a cost efficiency perspective. Um, those are now very commonplace in the market, but getting involved in the very early days was, was exciting. Um, one of the initiators we formed related to that was what's called care focused purchasing which existed for about five years where we brought together 40 or 50 of the largest employers in the country with all of the top insurance carriers 
um, and really did the first large scale assessment of physician and hospital performance and then used that to uh, uh, you know, develop new products and services for the market. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, there was the new rage in employee benefits, something called private exchanges. Won't go into detail on what they are. Um, other than to say it was a different way of offering benefits to employees that offered some more choice to employees and some cost control opportunities for employers. Um, Mercer's version of that we call Mercer Marketplace, uh, still around, still going strong, very large business for us. Um, I had an opportunity to lead that business from inception. We, we started um, it was a little bit similar to what Sam was saying. We, we started with 10 people dedicated to that business. And two years later, we had 1,000 people uh, involved in Mercer Marketplace. So it was really exponential growth. Um, just a little bit of stress, but still a lot of exponential growth. And then for the past uh, five years, I've been leading our health business um, in the East which is uh, in Mercer jargon, every state that touches the Atlantic and somehow the East has Tennessee and Kentucky also, even though we know they don't touch the Atlantic. Um, Mercer Marketplace is now part of our overall health business. So that's a, that's a very um, large health business, probably the largest health business in the industry, not just within Mercer, but within the industry overall. Um, on the personal side, I've been married for a long time. Um, I have four kids and I have no intention of catching up to Sam. Um, and trust me when I say you have to have the kids before you have the grandkids and it makes it all worth it. So I'll end there and turn it over. Hi everyone, I'm Allison Lum. Um, I am a principal in the wealth practice within Mercer, and as Michaela had said, I have been in both the defined benefit kind of actuarial side, and now I'm in the um, defined contribution side. So to kind of walk you through my career path, I grew up on a small island right off of Seattle, Washington. I attended the University of Washington and have degrees in both math and economics. And I think as many folks at Mercer find, you kind of fall into the actuarial world, sometimes by choice and sometimes by chance. Um, mine was definitely by chance. I was a math major and a sophomore and talking to a friend of mine who lived across the hall. And I was saying, you know, I didn't want to teach math, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And he said, well, you know, my older brother has a math degree and he's an actuary. And I don't even really know what he does, but he works in a big firm downtown. Why don't you give him a call? And I did. Um, he was very gracious and kind of explained what the role was and what Mercer was. I became very intrigued, uh, applied for an internship and started working at Mercer in the summer after my junior year. Um, I was an actuarial analyst, so I did a kind of a myriad of things. I was um, responsible for some data manipulation. There was some client interaction at that time, but basically I was just kind of learning the ropes of what a consulting firm is, what we do. Um, really enjoyed myself, stayed with Mercer throughout my senior year of college, and then accepted a full-time role as an actuarial analyst after I graduated from the UW. Um, I stayed with Mercer for and kind of in that defined benefit space for about seven or eight years. Um, I, you know, started as an analyst. At that time, a lot of it is relatively technical. You're kind of learning the ropes of how to value pension plans. Um, and then as you move up, you know, I became a senior analyst and then kind of what we used to call a junior consultant. So I was helping manage our client relationships. I was helping some of the younger analysts with their work, acting as a peer reviewer for the more kind of complicated math that we do. Um, during this time, I you know, got married to my husband. I was also taking actuarial exams, which a little bit of an eye chart on the screens, but I tried to put a joke in there about how exams seem to take forever and they can. <laughs> um, 
But, um, you know, as I kind of progressed up through the defined benefit space and working with pension plans, I really enjoyed myself. But I always had um, kind of an idea of being flexible in my career and volunteering myself for different types of projects, especially when I had, you know, some time or, or interest. Um, there were several people in our Seattle office that were what we call a defined contribution specialist. So they worked instead of with pension plans with those larger defined benefit plans, they helped clients with their 401k plan. Um, I volunteered to help out on some projects with them. I really liked it. And so I kept volunteering. At one point, I was what we now call kind of dual hatting, where you're effectively splitting your time between two different practice groups within Mercer. So I did actuarial work as well as this defined contribution consulting work. Um, you know, with the downturn of the economy, DC plans kind of were becoming more and more prevalent and popular. And I saw that as a, a good path for me to take going forward, where I knew that there would be a lot of clients and new work coming in. So I chose to move from the actuarial world kind of into this DC consulting world, as we say. Um, within that, the work is very varied. We do things um, that are very technical. So kind of my math background and being good at Excel and I have some computer programming background, um, that has been very beneficial. We also do a lot of you know, client interactions and client discussions and strategic um, you know, projects with them where we're really trying to figure out what's the best plan design for a specific company to help get their employees to the best retirement and wealth accumulation that, that they can. Um, so within the DC group, I have become a technical expert. So there's just another joke I tried to put in here. Um, I'm a member of the non-discrimination testing. It's called the TECO. It's the Technical Center of Excellence. It's a national group within the wealth practice of folks that kind of focus on some of the more technical aspects of our job. Um, the non-discrimination testing is not, as my uh, little circle there says, hit the of the back door, that type of non-discrimination. Um, in you know qualified retirement plans, we always have to be ensuring that the highly paid folks that are in the plan are not getting a disproportionate benefit than the kind of regular non-highly compensated, the rank and file. Um, it's their somewhat technical and mathematical tests that need to be run on plans every year, and so I help um, a lot of our clients do that type of work. Um, you know, so while I've been a Mercer on a personal level, yeah, I got married, I had two kiddos. Um, at that point as well, I reduced my time to a 60% uh, FTE, you know, so I'm not full-time employee anymore, I'm part-time. Um, one of the things that has kept me at Mercer so long is Mercer's incredible flexibility. They are wonderful at allowing folks to change career paths if you like, you know, like I did. Um, drop down from a full-time uh, job to a part-time job if that's what works for you from a personal standpoint. Um, I've been very you know, blessed to be able to kind of be home a little bit more with my kids and I work and I get the job done. And Mercer is also excellent in the sense of they aren't requiring people to work a certain place or at a certain time. Um, we trust our folks to get the work done and do it in a timely fashion and deliver excellence to our clients. And so if you need to be doing that on a weekend because you couldn't fit it in on a Friday, you know, that's okay. And, and that's what needs to happen. Um, and then recently I've joined the Wealth Leadership Advisory Group, which is a kind of small group of folks who get together and effectively help um, our senior leadership team brainstorm lead initiatives. We also kind of act as a liaison between the executive leadership team and kind of the rest of our, our consulting group as well. So, um, you know, I've been with Mercer almost 20 years. I, I am extremely grateful for all of the different opportunities that I've had here. Again, I think one of the things that, um, you know, similar to what Sam and Eric has said, the people that you work with at Mercer are really exquisite. We are extremely bright and hard workers and really good teammates. Um, you know, we really work together well as a team. And I think that we understand that uh, we need to serve our clients the best and the best we, we can do that is to all work together and, and pull our weight. So um, I've been very happy here and, um, and I'm kind of excited to see what 
what the next maybe 19 years has in store. And I look forward to any questions you may have once we go through everyone else. Excellent. Um, so Andre Rooks here, I think I'm the last presenter. And as I was thinking about today, I asked myself, well, what would I want to hear if I was a participant? Well, so I would want to hear that um, that there's a role for people that don't have the hardest degrees and that there's a role for people that don't take a very linear approach to, uh, or didn't take a very linear approach to their career. So really, I, you know, as I thought about myself and my best, right, right, how I should position myself today, I'm like the regular dude that didn't have the mathematics degree that is not the actuary and whose path was a bit circuitous as I was really exploring um, you know, how I would kind of navigate myself through my career. Um, so I wrote at the top, embrace and Adver adversity, because I only had two words. If I was to write the full title for kind of my career path journey, it would be follow your interests, embrace adversity and change, and don't be afraid of failure. I have failed. I will highlight places for you where I have failed. I have been fired. I have been at companies where they imploded. And I've learned from each and every one of those experiences. And so from, you know, the takeaway from my part is, you know, to kind of embrace the adversity and, and change and kind of roll with it. Um, in 2022, I will be, so I'm Andre Rooks. I'm a senior principal located in Chicago um, in the career practice. And starting in January, 2022, I'll be the office business leader for career in Chicago. And so my, journey starts with, I was born on the south side of Chicago uh, way back when, probably when Eric started college, but I'll just kind of um, I'll kind of move on. Uh, so I was born on the south side of Chicago. So I started uh, my college at the University of Illinois. And what's interesting about it is that I ended with an economics degree, but I started with chemical engineering, right? I loved chemistry. I did chem E and, you know, organic was no good. And so I failed at organic chemistry and said, well, okay, what else do I like? I like business. And so I made a long transition to business economics. Um, so the takeaway there is, you know, we have all made changes and kind of embrace what you like and kind of move ahead, make, make that change. Um, so I liked business and I knew I wanted to do consulting, but I wasn't really up to speed in terms of what was strategy consulting or tech consulting or HR consulting. Uh, so I went to Accenture. They were a technology consultant. It was not what I was expecting. I, you know, I had to learn how to code, but you know what? It was kind of interesting. And it was something that I allowed myself the space to be bad at and to eventually be passable at, right? So, you know, did extension for a number of years, found that I liked the technology space and I gave myself, you know, the opportunity to code. And now I can't say that I'm good, but I can code in three languages, um, older languages, but something that I never thought I could do, right? So the takeaway there is just give yourself, give yourself um, the space to learn. Uh, you may find that you pick up things that you never thought you would. Um, so this is, you know, the late, um, really the early 2000s with, with the tech boom. And so I, like lots of other people, I think, um, I'm not sure if it was Eric or somebody, um, I went to this startup called Closer Look. They were also connected to this um, incubator called Diamond Technologies Partners. I'm not sure if it's the same company, but was a startup company. Um, so I took a risk to go to startup and you know what? It failed, <laughs> right? We, we worked for a while, we tried to bring in a new company and the company imploded. And about three quarters of the staff was laid off. I was one of those people that were laid off. You know what? I learned from that experience. I learned that at a startup, there's high rewards and there's high risk. And if you're comfortable with it, you, you, know, you get the reward if you get there and if you don't, it's okay. Um, so I learned my lesson and went to a second startup um, at Shorebank Advisory Services. I was there as an analyst and we did great work there. Um, uh, but again, it was a risk, right? Um, that was at the time when financial services institutions were having some trouble. And you know what? Shorebank, which, is, which owned the technology company, the, the advisory company, um, they were foreclosed upon. The bank crumbled and I was out of a job, uh, but that was fine. Uh, because I made the choice then to also transition into uh, the Booth School of Business. Uh, but again, the takeaway there is it didn't end as I expected. 
but I learned a lot through the experience and I was not afraid to kind of take that risk. And it got me to one of the better business schools in the country. Um, so I did University of Chicago Business School for a while. And unlike my friends who went to consulting or banking, I actually went to Chicago Public Schools to work in their strategy group. Why? Because I think public education is important. And I was not afraid to kind of take a year or two or three to kind of follow that passion of mine. And so I did. I spent about a year and a half there before I got this random call from this random company talking about career consulting. Um, so that company was Hewitt, um, now known as Aon Consulting. And I grew up in my career, you know, in career consulting at, at Hewitt, uh, doing great work. But then I got another call a number of years later from this company called Mercer saying, hey, can you come and do some of the same things that you do at Hewitt? But in fact, we'll give you a bigger pond to play in. And we'll make sure that you can not just consult to one small group of employees, but you can consult to the broader group. And so I, how could I turn that down? And so I've been here at Mercer for the last um, eight years, I think. Um, and I'm doing great things. Super enjoy um, the, the clients that I have, the work that I do. Um, so I'm not gonna say a whole bunch about the career practice. I can describe that to you a bit later. But for me, it was important to show you that there does not need to be a purely linear path to your career. You don't need to always, well, if you are in math, you know, kudos to you because you're smarter than me. Uh, but there's other paths um, that one can take at Mercer and be quite successful. Uh, so that's it. Um, Michaela, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Andre. Thanks, everyone. Like These stories were incredible. Um, you have extremely dynamic career paths, and I think it's super helpful for everyone on the call to see, you know, where you've been from, you know, people starting as interns and growing in the in the business to um, to coming in later on in their career and and growing in the business. So um, and congratulations to you, Andre, on getting the OVL assignment in Chicago. So I look forward to working with you personally. Um, and so, yeah, at this point, um, we are going to open up the floor to questions. Um, I don't think that we have any in the chat currently, but um, we do invite you to come, you know, enable your camera, turn your camera on, come off mute, ask your question, use that. I see Charlotte's using the hand raising function, which is awesome. So, you know, we can, we'll go through and, and call on people to ask their question. Um, so yeah, let's start with Charlotte. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, my name is Charlotte Morelli. I'm a senior at Tulane University. I'm graduating this December and I'm studying economics and psychology. So first, thank you. All of these talks were so fascinating um, and insightful hearing about everyone's career paths. I specifically have a question for Eric and um, managed competition. So I find that super fascinating. I've never heard of it. I actually worked for an insurance brokerage firm this past summer. And I'm curious how through that process you facilitate the information to brokers or are you mainly working with the carriers and helping them go through that competition process? So thanks Charlotte. So we, we, we were the broker, so we weren't working with any other brokers. We, we actually um, did this back a long time ago for a little company called Xerox, which is where we piloted it. Back in those days, the um, healthcare landscape was dominated in, in a lot of ways by HMOs or health maintenance organizations. It, it no longer is today. Um, and Xerox offered around the country, believe it or not, 250 of them. So in every market, there were anywhere from two to six or seven choices and we pitted the HMOs head to head against each other to compete on price and benefits. And those that competed better were offered to employees at lower cost, those that didn't were offered at higher cost. Um, and it really encouraged a tremendous degree of um, you know, positive outcomes, positive behavior, both from the HMOs because you know competition makes you improve, and you know they had a goal of having high enrollment and getting a lot of people to say I want you, um, and it also fostered a lot of the right behavior among uh, the employees who made choices that were in their economic best interest. 
So there's, there's a lot more to the story. We, we do manage competition these days in very different ways, and it's not even called managed competition anymore. But we, we very often pit different care providers against each other to compete for an employer's business. Thank you. Wow, that is such a cool experiment and business model. Um, so is Mercer Marketplace the name for that brokerage process? So Mercer Marketplace didn't come into being until about 2010, 2011. Um, the market had, had significantly shifted by then, but, but, the, but a lot of those fundamental principles of managed competition are still in there. So we, we let um, insurance carriers, health plans compete on the basis of uh, quality and price and plan provisions, Plan provisions just meaning, you know, how, how costs are shared with employees. And then we offer a platform that provides a lot of decision support um, to employees to help them make the best decisions for them. So I don't want to control this, um, this panel too much. Could I ask another follow-up question really quickly, if that's okay? Um, sure, one more, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so do carriers reach out to you wanting to be a part of this process or do you reach out to the carriers? Are they like excited to be a part of the managed competition? Would they pay for it? Um, they're, they're excited when they win the managed competition. They, they, they feel that it's an unfair process when they lose. And, and I'm only half joking. So the, the health insurance market for employers in the US today is dominated by let's say um, eight to 10 different carriers. Um, as the largest um, health consultant and broker in the business, we have significant relationships with all of those carriers. And sometimes we work in partnership with them on behalf of our clients to bring new products to market. Sometimes we you know, beat the crap out of them to uh, <laughs> make sure that they deliver um, what is promised to, uh, to their clients. Um, we actually have an executive sponsor for each of those major carrier relationships, and those are important, uh, you know, important partners for us. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your questions. Thanks, Eric. James. Hi, everyone. My name is James Johnson. I'm a current senior at UT Arlington's College of Business, focusing in management. I'm expected to graduate this December. Um, first of all, thank you for taking your time out of the day to speak with us and kind of share your knowledge. Um, my question was for Mr. Brooks. Uh, I really enjoyed how you kind of left the, the private startup space and then went and worked for the school district. I think that's awesome. Um, I actually work for the university right now myself. My question is, um, I saw that you moved from the uh, school district to Hewitt and then on to Mercer. What do you think, in your opinion, is Mercer's competitive advantage that it has against uh, similar firms such as Hewitt? Yep. So happy. So thank you for that question. I'm happy to talk about the benefits of Mercer. Um, let me first just describe what practice that I'm in because it may differ across insurance. I'm not related to insurance at all. Um, so I'm in Mercer's career practice. And in the career practice, we I work with organizations to help them define the rewards that they provide to employees and the structure of the organization. So like workforce analytics, um, executive rewards, broad-based rewards, sales compensation, the things that relate to how jobs are organized or people are paid is what I do, okay? Uh, so in the career space, I would say the differentiation between us and some of our competitors are that we are a true consultancy, right? So there are other organizations that do HR data and a little bit of consulting. Uh, we are consulting first. HR is the content area in which we do our consulting. Um, and so if that distinction makes sense to you, um, then that really differentiates Mercer from others. So consulting engagements, we do projects. We, of course, we have some products that we sell, but that's not our, our thrust. Our thrust is defining customized solutions that meet the needs of our clients. And so if you're interested in consulting first environments, then I would say Mercer would be one that should be of interest to you. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, that I've attended a few of these career panels and uh, the one that the division that interests me the most is the career division of Mercer. So that's promising to hear. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Hi, my question is also for Mr. Rooks. And I was just curious, I'm also um, interested in the career division. I'm a student at Indiana University studying economic consulting, um, marketing and sustainable business. And my question was, what is the most re rewarding part of the job for you? And how does Mercer support that? Yeah, so thank you for the question. You're certainly smarter than me. I could. I I lost count of the number of majors that you had, but it's whatever it was, it was sounding very impressive. Uh, the most rewarding part of the job for me is when I can act, is when I can enact real change that impacts real people, right? So I mentioned that we do a lot of work in rewards and I described executive rewards, which are the CEO, CFO, the head of those, right? And other employees. So I'm gonna tell you a story about the other employees, the blue collar folks that I also work with. Um, I was working with a window manufacturing company who's having a problem with turnover. They had more than 50% of turnover a, a year, which meant that they were losing half of their employees every single year. And kind of came to me and to us saying, well, you know, how can we fix how we motivate and reward these employees? As we did our analysis, we found that, yeah, there was some pay issues, but really there was something else that was causing lots of problems we learned that this company had no sick leave policy. They had only vacation. So what does that mean? It sounds kind of nerdy and kind of boring. It means that if somebody got sick in your household that you had to call in and ask for permission uh, to stay home with that sick family member to take care of them. Uh, so everything had to be permission-based and managers were saying, no, you, you can't take off. So what did that mean? That meant that if you had somebody sick at home, you had an unexcused absence three absences, three strikes, you're out. And so they were having people that were being terminated for doing things as simple and as basic as taking care of their family. And so what we work with this organization to kind of do is to put in what we called no notice leave days. Again, it sounds super boring, right? But it gave people something that they needed that they didn't have before. And so when I look back on some of my most rewarding experiences, it's when I can work with an organization to enact real change that changes actual people's lives. And that's one of those stories that I have. Thank you, that's amazing, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Let me go to one question in the chat that Alina Washington asked from, she's a senior from Babson College and she says, and let me shoot this to Sam. Sam, do you have um, an anecdote from a project that you've worked on that you're most proud of? Um, what were some of the highs and lows of the project, if any, um, and what did post-project success, success look like? Uh, the, the thought that came to me when you when you posed the question to me was in my first um, first couple months at Mercer, uh, I was working on a new client in Kentucky, and they were issuing a two billion dollar uh, Medicaid managed care initiative, and Mercer was their consulting and financial advisor. And the principal was out of the office and he was away for the day and the client called me directly. So this is a big client for the firm. $2 billion is coming out in the street to basically really impact the healthcare landscape of the state of Kentucky. And he says, Sam, I have a meeting with the vendors today. I need those trend values. And so here I am two months into Mercer. I can't release that, those values. I haven't even had them reviewed by the principal yet. You know, we've put them together. I, they're, they're not ready. So I called him, I said, well, you know, uh, Steve's not here right now, but let me get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you so much. And, you know, start back then paging Steve, calling his house. Like, I don't know what to do here. So he calls back again an hour later, says, I'm, you know, plans are coming down to negotiate trend. I need those values so I can share it with them. And I was like, I'm working on that. We will get it to you or get something to you, but I haven't done it yet. So he calls back again an hour later. He's like, Sam, I need the values. They're going to be here in two hours. I haven't even seen them yet. Can I have those values? And I'm like, um, you know, Mercer doesn't believe that it would be in the best interest of the state to reveal that information right now to the plans because it's a highly contentious negotiable item. Better to have them do it on their own. And for now, just have them, you know, have it be part of the conversation of what we're doing conceptually. Here's some talking points. 
Um, and we'll get those trend values to you later. So I had to think on my feet. And I remember calling my fiance then saying, I don't know, I just affected a $2 billion negotiation. I've been here two months, may go well, I may be unemployed tomorrow, we'll see. Um, and so I just remember that moment. And then so uh, Steve, the principal walked in later that afternoon, he's like, so what happened today? And I was like, uh, you missed it. And so I just did a brief, he was like, hey, good, you know, well played, good job. I'll call up, you know, the client and we'll get everything buttoned up. But, you know, you handled it well and that was it. And I just remember in the middle of it, I was like, I don't know if this is right. I don't know if I've just changed, you know, the lives of a hundred people in this negotiation, but I did the best I could. And I love the fact that the firm supported me. I love the fact that I was empowered to think on my feet and trusted to do so. And I guess I got a little charged that I was kind of in the middle of it all at the moment. So those are some things I loved about my career at Mercer early on. Um, and honestly, if you look at my whole career path, it was always, I'd like to try this, go try it, go have fun, let me know how that works out. And they gave me the rope to try new things and kind of chart my own path. Everything you saw in my bubbles, I, I was the one that wanted to do it and took that step in my career. So there you go. Thank you. Um... Rebecca. Hi, my name is Rebecca. Um, I'm a senior at UT Dallas um, and I'm graduating in December. Uh, so one of the areas that I'm really interested in for career wise is marketing. So I was really curious, um, what does Mercer do in terms of marketing? Is it done on a regional basis, uh, individual level or on a firm basis in general? And is there any way for interns or for entry level positions in a marketing capacity? You want me to take that? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks for the question, Rebecca. Um, I, I, I can't believe you don't see Mercer like plastered over every internet site that you go to and, you know, TV ads. And, and I'm only kidding. That, that sort of marketing, we, we really don't do much, at least in the U.S. Um, because we, we are primarily, uh, you know, B2B, business to business. Sometimes it's business to business to consumer, but there's almost always the business in between. Having said that, we, we do a lot of marketing um, to, uh, to employers and other interested stakeholders. Um, we have a fairly large marketing group, um, which would also include public relations and media relations. We, as you might imagine, we do a lot of uh, press interviews, whether radio, TV, print, whatever. Um, so there's a, a global marketing organization that then funnels down to our different uh, you, you know, operating regions. Uh, here it would be US and, and Canada. And then we have um, people in those groups who are dedicated to one of our specific lines of business, either health, wealth, or career. So for example, in the US, we have a head of marketing for US health. Um, I'll give you an example of um, what our marketing people get involved in. We just launched a platform called Mercer Indigo which is a platform for gig workers, which is you know, now tens of millions of people who don't have a formal employee-employer relationship, but they're contractors, temps, you know, broadly speaking, gig workers. Um, and our marketing team was very involved in developing the collateral for that, hosting webcasts. We actually did do some uh, targeted advertising around that. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, when we're rolling out new products or services, when we're just trying to build market awareness, uh, we, we do have a marketing group. I don't know offhand um, what they are looking for right now in terms of hiring, but uh, we could certainly help make, make the connection. So let me add to that, Eric, and provide two additional thoughts, right? So Mercer, as you all know, is within the parent company of Marsha McLennan, right? So when I think about the broader organization of Marsha McLennan, they are two parts of that business that may be of interest to marketers, right? There's the Oliver Wyman Management Consulting business, 
who employs and kind of works with marketing majors to kind of you know be consultants. Um, there's also the Lippincott business, which is underneath Oliver Wyman, I believe, which is a brand consultancy which employs marketers. Um, so we'd be happy for you to join Mercer. But if you're interested in the broader MMC family, Oliver Wyman, number one, Lippincott, number two, are avenues for marketers. And I would also add in there that Career has a communications practice too that develops internal you know, comms to, for their clients to um, help promote their rewards and um, whatever and, and, and benefits that, that are being provided so that their employees know to take advantage of those things within their businesses. So, um, so that's another option too if you're interested in communications and marketing comms. There's a portion of that that happens in career as well. Um, but you can also take a look on our website, um, or careers at mmc.com. There are, when we have opportunities that don't exist within the specific, you know, that we're going out to campus and specifically recruiting for, those opportunities are posted on our website when we have openings within those, those different areas. Um, there was one question that I wanted to throw out there. I'm going to throw it to Allison. Um, and and it's kind of, so this question specifically is asking, um, are there opportunities for physic majors? And I think in a broader sense of that question, what are we looking for in our candidates? What are you looking for to make a, a successful team member um, you know, within the business? And, and I think that can cross, you know, transcend various majors. Um, so what are those attributes that make a successful colleague? Yeah, I mean, I think within the wealth practice, I would say the biggest thing that I always look for is enthusiasm. You know, um, a lot of what we do, we can teach you. You know, I, I came to Mercer yeah, right out of school. I didn't know anything about actuarial science. I wasn't an actuarial science major. I was a math major. Uh, you learn a lot of the technical stuff on the job. So, you know, as, as an entry-level position, I never kind of worry about someone knowing some technical fact about something. Um, I always look for, yeah, enthusiasm, a willingness to learn, a willingness to raise your hand and say, yes, I would like to help on this project. Yes, I would like to you know, be a part of this client team. Yes, I want to learn about something. Um, you know, similar to what Andre said, we have people that came in, at least within our practice, from all aspects. We have very non-technical folks that have Kind of transition into very technical uh, consultants. We have lawyers that work on our team. I have, you know, I'm I'm a very technical person, but um, one of the women I work with very closely and on a day to day basis, I think, was a communications major in college. And so it, you know, there is a huge kind of gamut of what your background can be. But um, at least within the practice that I work in. Um, we are looking for folks that are willing to learn, that are excited, that are engaged, that can meet a deadline, that can communicate effectively. And, you know, if you're having a problem with a project, you raise your hand and ask for help. You know, those are all people that will succeed within Mercer. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of it is being willing to jump into a project. And um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but you just keep trying. Um, you know, grit effectively is, is important. Yeah, I think that's a, a that's a perfect answer. Um, and and to summarize, we don't we don't require specific majors, um, actuarial science, actuarial opportunities. We do look for people who are on that path that want to complete exams and become an actuary. You don't necessarily have to have an exam pass at the start, but you do have to have sort of that commitment to completing exams. Um, but outside of that. We're very open to majors across the board. Um, you know, you being an analytical thinker in general, being a problem solver, and everything else that Allison mentioned, um, especially those strong communication skills, since it's a client-facing role um, in most cases, uh, is really important. And the things that we can't actually teach you, but the technical stuff we can. Um, and I hate that we're at you know one minute past the hour because I feel like this could go on for a whole nother hour, but. Um, if you have one more second, I would just like to close and ask each of you to just give one piece of advice that you would give to your college age self at this point, um, if you were to, you know, go back in the day and, um, you know, and rewind the clock a little bit. What would you tell yourself now, um, based on your career thus far? Want me to go first? 
Yeah, jump right in. <laughs> okay, Tarek. Um, I would say be confident and show confidence, but don't be overconfident. Um, you know, I, I, I should have recognized right from the outset that there's a lot more that I didn't know than I did know. So that's kind of a fine balance to, to walk, but it's an important one. Yeah, I would say um, volunteer for different types of projects and, um, you know, look outside of your actual practice. You know, uh, we have a lot of opportunities where folks have transitioned from pension actuarial to health or vice versa. I would say um, don't necessarily get stuck in what you think a career path needs to be. If an opportunity comes your way and it seems interesting, say yes. I'm going to jump in. I would say trust in yourself. Right. There's this thing known as the imposter syndrome. You may deal with it, I deal with it. Whereas you're in this role that you think that you really aren't prepared for it, you're an imposter. Um, fact of the matter is we're all imposters. We're all learning, we're all failing, right? And so to kind of trust in yourself and have the confidence that you can actually make it happen. And I would just wrap all that up and I'd say do, do meaningful work, which is my tagline, because at the end of the day, when you're taking that risky assignment that you don't know how to do, or you're working till midnight on something that's really late and really hard, if it's significant for you, that's what pulls you through those difficult times. Awesome. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, thank you for staying on a couple of minutes extra. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your expertise. I look forward to the next one that we're hosting on uh, October 12th, I believe. Um, and Thank you to all the participants for staying with us and for asking these great questions. Um, we will follow up this session with the recording um, as well as our contact information and give you some instruction on where to find our job postings, um, but they are listed in Handshake. So um, have a great rest of your day and um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.